I tell people I have 20% vision in my right eye. I don't know if that's true. My doctor told me it when I was 15. I just believed him because he seemed like he knew what he was talking about. He told me he was a doctor, but I couldn't see his qualifications. <laughs> I am Josh Davies. I'm 25 years old. I want to perform and I want to write comedy and I want to make things that are funny as a job. And that's slowly becoming my full-time thing. I've been performing comedy for about six years now. I have quite a dark sense of humour, and that, I think, was influenced from growing up with my eyesight like this. I am fully blind in my left eye, and I have not a lot of vision in my right eye. I love comedy, and I love making something that a bunch of people who I don't know find funny. I'm blind, so if you enjoy this, you'd better laugh because your smiles mean nothing. <laughs> uh, what's wrong with my eyes is actually quite boring. Uh, unless you're an optometrist, then it's like injecting heroin between your toes. <laughs> In comedy, you learn how to tell a joke, and that joke gets a laugh, and then you feel good, and you go, OK, how do I do this better? Because everyone in comedy wants comedy to be better. I grew up in Levin and I moved to Auckland four years ago to pursue comedy. I was never like a funny person at school. I wasn't like a class clown or anything. I think I was vaguely funny in my friend group, I guess. I've got this rare genetic disorder called X-linked retinoschisis. And what, what it is is the X-linked part means it's a genetic disorder on the X chromosome, which is the female chromosome. So women don't typically get this disorder. So my mum had two X chromosomes and she gave me the broken one. <laughs> It's a real passive-aggressive way to say you wanted a daughter. <laughs> at the moment, I've got a show at the New Zealand International Comedy Festival. So this is the whole show. It's about seven and a half thousand words, and it is just paragraphs and paragraphs of text. And I memorise it pretty much word for word. I first started getting into comedy when I was about 15 or 16, watching comedy on YouTube and on Netflix and finding all these great comedians that are out there and seeing what they were doing and then finding out that it's a job that you can do and get paid for uh, to just be funny. My disability is like climate change, all my parents' fault. <laughs> Doesn't matter how much I recycle, my eyes are a lost cause. <laughs> I went to university and that went terribly. So after a year, I was like, OK, now I need to do comedy properly. Hey, Alice. Alice. Go on. My first three shows were all in front of, like, 120 people. In a room of 120 people, if 60 of them are laughing, it sounds great. If 120 of them are laughing, it sounds amazing. And from that moment on, I was like, oh, this is, this is excellent. This is all the validation I want all the time. It's a very narcissistic and egotistical thing. But there's lots of not laughing that happens that balances that out and humbles you, I think. Growing up with a disability has definitely influenced my comedy style. Not just because I tell lots of blind jokes, but I think my taste in comedy as well. Like, I have quite a dark sense of humour. Whenever I would meet other kids who are blind or meet other people with disabilities, you would always make horrific jokes. The game was to make those jokes and to push those boundaries. And that's definitely influenced my comedy style. Between about the ages of six and seven, my left eye, which before that had been my better eye, began to deteriorate, then went totally blind. And I have about 20% vision in my right eye. My brother, he's, uh, he's got the same eye condition as me, but it's very different. Like, his eyes are pretty much fine. Our parents just made us share everything as kids, like bikes, PlayStations, disabilities, all of it. <laughs> I grew up on farms in Levin. My parents train racehorses, and so it was a very outdoorsy, very hands-on childhood. Like, I crashed a tractor when I was three. 
Um, I don't think that was to do with my eyesight. I think that was to do with me being three and driving a tractor. Josh was pretty active. He just did about everything. He joined in with us, him and his brother. They were quite close, so we had them down. They just play around on the farm, and there wasn't anything he didn't want to do. And you wouldn't know that he couldn't see. He started playing hockey, made a rep team. I don't know how he played. So say, how do you know where the ball is? I just watch how the players are. You name it, he would have a go at it. Yeah, when I was about two or three, the doctors started to notice that my eyesight wasn't where it should be and I wasn't following along with lights or with movement very well. And yeah, I think he had seven operations in the end and I actually sat through all of them and watched the whole lot of them. From him having the gas to put him out the whole lot. We used to have a little ritual, as to say, think about being on the beach with an ice cream and, and he sl slowly would go away. My main memories of it aren't about worrying whether I was gonna go blind, it was like, it was about knowing that I was gonna get to go to McDonald's after we went to an eye appointment. <laughs> People always ask me, like, what it's like to be blind, but I've been blind my entire life, so I just say normal. <laughs> It's not really a satisfactory answer for a lot of people, so they reply, no, it's not. <laughs> That's the problem is, for me, it was normal, and people very quickly adjust to their circumstances, right? Because what's normal for me is when I was a kid, me and my brother would tease our little sister by saying, you don't have the same rare genetic disorder we do. <laughs> You're clearly adopted. <laughs> we, would, we, would, we would tease her, and one time we were doing it, my dad came in, and he was like, actually, you two are adopted. We got you as a two-for-one because you're broken. <laughs> Comedy is very stressful a lot of the time, but it's also very fun. If the jokes work, you get this huge rush of adrenaline and validation, and you're instantly like, OK, great, I'm funny. And then the next joke might die horrifically and nobody will laugh at it, and then it's the exact opposite. Um, and you're like, oh, they hate me, I'm a terrible writer, I should never have done comedy. Like, I always get, used to get a lot of questions when I was younger as well, especially, especially as a teenager. Like, I used to get asked, how many fingers am I holding up? Which is me saying I have a disability, and then going, prove it. <laughs> After spending 20 years with my eyesight, I know what areas I need help with and what I don't. To St Luke's is due to depart in two minutes. Technology like has come along so much that it, for me that solves a lot of the issues. It's so, like I use a magnifying glass on my phone. If I'm going out to dinner, I will look up the menu of the place on my phone first. Like trying to find a place I can use Google Maps and in real time and with the GPS be pretty accurate that I know I'm going in the right direction or yeah, if I'm somewhere unfamiliar, I don't need to see the street signs because I can follow the Google Maps. I've set up a routine and a lifestyle, I guess, where I get to avoid a lot of the barriers. I pay higher rent to live closer to my work and to town so that I don't have to spend more on public transport, more time on public transport. Thank you. I have a job that's very accommodating. I work for Blind Low Vision New Zealand as a fundraiser. I write grant applications to philanthropic groups and legacy trusts to try and make up the 20 million plus budget that, that, that we have to get. So I've been working here for two years now and I originally got the job because I was doing some fundraising work. It was like supporter events because I was doing stand-up and sort of like, hey, come do some blind jokes here and talk to people about what it's like. And then a job opened up in the team, and they're like, hey, we like working with you, and we know you're a comedian and poor, do you want a job? And I was like, yes, yes, please. Because of comedy and trying to get funding for my own stuff, I'd done some grant writing work. So despite not being very experienced in the fundraising sector at all, they gave me the job. Blind Low Vision New Zealand definitely is one of the more accessible places for vision-related accessibility, at least. Uh, it would be quite bad if they weren't. 
uh, it would look very bad if no blind people could get around here. Uh, so there's lots of stuff in place on all the doors to meeting rooms, to the bathroom, and on the elevator there's Braille. Braille. Not great on camera, but that's not its target audience. The kitchens have adhesive dimples that they stick to the buttons on, like the microwave and the kettle and stuff like that. Microwave nipples. And there's also guide dog users in the building, so there's guide dog runs around the building. Foam. Soft. <laughs> that foreknowledge that I will go totally blind, that should terrify me and make me more appreciative of what I have now, but I'm not. Like, I'll stare into an eclipse just for fun. <laughs> And that's because, like, I, right now I have a disability that isn't really disabling, you know? Like, the most disabling thing is uh, people's assumption that my eyesight means I can't do something, when the real reason is that I don't try very hard. <laughs> In comedy, you can form a connection with people, with, with a bunch of people, on your terms, and you don't have to worry about whether you've said or done the right thing because it's very obvious in the moment. Like, if you've, done, if you've done something right, the whole room is laughing. If you've done something wrong, they're not. It's a lot of hard work, but it's also very rewarding. During the comedy festival, I've got 10-hour shows to do, five nights in Wellington and then five nights in Auckland. It's basically all completely self-funded. I have a registration fee that I pay to the comedy festival, my venue hire fee, my accommodation, my flights down to Wellington, and advertising costs. I've put money into online marketing and poster runs in Auckland and Wellington. I think I had to spend four and a half thousand for this comedy festival, which covered, yeah, all of those accommodation, venues, marketing. I hopefully make that back through ticket sales. Making the money back on ticket sales is the most terrifying thing to me. I've spent more this year than I normally would, which means that my break-even point is a lot higher, which means I need to get more audience in. The big dream is to be able to lose four grand and not have to worry about it. Josh, is, um, we can't understand how we take the risk we do with the horses, and yet he's quite prepared to hop up in front of a bar full of drunks to try and make them appreciate how clever he is and how you know, the stand-up comedy, the amount of work he puts into it, uh, it, it even amazes us because he wouldn't get up at school to accept an award for anything virtually he would run rather than get up there. So you know what's not funny? Your parents supporting you. <laughs> Yeah, and so, so that, you know, they'd never treat me any different. I couldn't use my eyesight as an excuse. I'd be like, oh, I can't feed the horses, I'm blind. Like, well, too bad, if you don't hurry up, you'll miss country calendar. <laughs> Which for farmers is a genuine threat. <laughs> On a farm, especially when it's a family farm and it was just like my parents and my siblings, if we didn't do it, it didn't get done. My dad taught me to drive because we needed someone to drive when we were doing the hay bales. Very physical and outdoorsy. I got bitted by horses, I got kicked by horses, I grabbed electric fences. There's all sorts of stuff that goes on, and a lot of the time it's nothing to do with the eyesight. And I think that is part of the experience. Whether you can see or not, it doesn't really matter. He's done the yard, got there. I'd... <laughs> If you've ever been to some of those gigs, it is hard, yeah? It's just tough guy. No, he's done well. We grew up on a farm as well, so I never really got treated any differently, because like, farmers only have kids so they don't have to pay employees. <laughs> and, and, yeah, so, and that's great, but it kinda, I kind of do wish I'd had a bit of neglect. It would have made writing comedy a lot easier. <laughs> I moved up to Auckland for comedy. Moving was really easy, in part because I had nothing. Like, I, I had like one bag of clothes and a computer. And I moved up with friends as well. I moved up with four other comedians. We were all broke. We had no money. We'd all pool our money together. We bought a couch for a dollar and then had to spend $70 getting it delivered to our house because none of us drove. I bought the first cheapest bed I could find on Trade Me for like 50 bucks and then had back problems for a year. 
we were all just like young and rookie comics and we're like, we want to get out and perform as much as possible and you're getting to know everyone. Comedy can be quite welcoming, especially if you're funny, then people are like, oh, who's this new funny person? I recently I was at the supermarket with a friend of mine and he was like, well, what do you do if you can't find something in here? I just said, well, then I don't buy it. What do you do? <laughs> My main friend group now is all comedians because you share a lot of the same interests and a lot of the same goals. Hey. Hey, Josh. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> there we go. Oh, 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 Funnier. I think he's, yeah. he's very, very talented and such a good writer. He's improved the most and he needed it. He was so bad, <laughs> you know. And yeah, if you think he's bad now. <laughs> oh, God, we should have watched him back yeah, in Wellington. Yeah, when we had to tolerate the oh, awful, awful, awful stuff. So, how did your shows go? They were, they were fine. First night in Wellington was terrible. Mm -hmm. Genuinely one of the worst gigs I think I've ever done. The material wasn't working as well, and because lots of it was new stuff, mm -hmm. like I was flubbing the lines and messing up setups and messing up punchlines and forgetting the order of stuff and just not performing it very well. Because that's how it's supposed to work, right? Your first show is meant to be your worst, and then your last show is your best. Yeah, right? it's meant it's meant to be your worst, but it, it shouldn't be that bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like you really need to do a show so many times before it becomes good and before you get in the like swing of it. Yeah, that's it. I record every show and then I listen back to it the next day. I find jokes that don't work and add in new jokes. I was walking along the waterfront on a very sunny day listening to my show and I was just I was like, I'm really enjoying this walk. It's quite nice out, <laughs> the ocean is good, it's chill. Why would and I ruin I'm ruining it, it by listening to myself talk. So I stopped it, I, I turned it off, I was like, this, I don't need to do this to myself. Yeah. Did you get much feedback? I did from blind people, I got some good feedback. Also, all of my hecklers, every every night I got a heckler, it was a blind person. Yeah. Uh, mm. See, well, yeah, that makes, well, that tracks with my experience with blind people, because I've known you for quite a while. Right? <laughs> <laughs> You're quite rude. You're quite rude. One night I had a dude, and he was like, you're being heckled by the blind guy. So I was like, yeah, that makes sense as to why you can't read the room. Uh, <laughs> Josh's vision didn't really negatively impact his ability to do comedy at all. He's very, very quick and um, mm. devastating. Because well, I realised that I have this, whether I want it or not, I am a public figure with some form of disability. So I have this role model presence. So I'm trying to be a better person because of that. I, I, so I started volunteering on a camp for blind kids. I, I, I did the same camp when I was a kid and I saw they needed volunteers. So it was this opportunity for me to give a new generation that same sense of belonging I felt when I went. Also, I wanted to steal the funny things they did from a comedy. <laughs> Why would I try and write jokes when I can watch a bunch of blind kids and just see what happened? And I remember just being so jealous. I felt like he was able to say quite, I don't know, dark, mm. I don't, dark things, like push the, push the envelope in a way that everyone in the audience was on board with and was just so incredibly funny. I, I, think, was... he'd, I think he'd want to go more morbid if he could. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> really. yeah. Once he gets a big following and he can say whatever he wants, I think he'll say some really awful things. Yeah, he's just, just truly, just again, just one of the worst people. <laughs> absolutely not, not someone I'd Complete support. Complete disaster. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Train wreck. A blind kids camp and a normal camp, they're pretty similar, because they're, you know, they are normal kids. They've got all the enthusiasm of a 10-year-old with eyes, just none of the eyes. <laughs> My favourite laugh to get is a, is a big laugh and then an oh no, or an ooh, because it's people laughing and then realising what they're laughing at. So you're, over, you're overriding their morality or their empathy to just get the laugh, and then that comes back in, and then they laugh at themselves for, for laughing at it, essentially, and it's like, it's this nice, combination of emotions that everyone is like, I'm a bad person for laughing at that, but everyone else here is too. I am working with a couple of other comedian friends on scripts for TV shows, which we'd like to get made. In New Zealand, that's quite difficult, but it's just a very good 
writing exercise. I feel like I've become a better writer because of it. If we can get it made, that's fantastic. And if not, you know, I was hanging out with friends and making dumb jokes and writing stuff, so it's not the end of the world. Yeah, so my, my plan for today was um, to basically plot out the first episode. Angela Dravage is a Billy T award-winning comedian and winner of Taskmaster and a star of John and Ben and a bunch of other stuff, as well as doing stand-up and being very good at it. I like Josh's perspective because he has a different view on things than I would, and it means that we build something that's richer. We are working on an animated show called Dreamcatchers, which is all about therapy through people's dreams, basically. When you're writing with someone else, the areas where you differentiate are where you can build on it. Like something Angela says will give me an idea and then that idea might give Angela another idea to build on it and like back and forth like that. Whereas if you're just by yourself, it's very easy to go with the first or second idea you have. And that's not, that's often not the best idea. So it, that sort of forces you to be better and to develop the idea more. I tried to start it off with essentially like an action sequence to show yeah. what the team is like without David mm -hmm. and set them up as like these like cool figures and then slowly devolving into bickering children. <laughs> <laughs> I like Josh's um, bluntness and honesty with his jokes. Like there's no middle ground. It's just this is the, he, he's not afraid to um, be completely brutally honest with his punchlines. Thank you guys so much for coming out to my show. I really appreciate it. I know I'm not like a like a, a famous comedian by any extent, so you've either seen me before and enjoyed it, or you're all just very left wing. You're like, oh, a disabled thing, let's do that. <laughs> I love comedy. You're making a whole bunch of strangers have a good time and enjoy their night. But ultimately, you're like, yeah, I got attention for 20 minutes, and they liked me. My name is Josh Davies. Good night. <laughs> I am trying to broaden my comedy career out partly to push myself and my ability, and also because that's sort of what you have to do to make money in comedy full-time, is to be versatile. I want to make TV shows. I'd love to make movies and write scripts. So if I can turn that into a form of income, that's great.